The 10 days beginning with Rosh Hashanah and culminating with Yom Kippur are collectively known in Jewish literature as the 10 days of repentance. And I think as a way of introduction, there's an amazing teaching of the Talmud in the book of Rosh Hashanah, page 18a. And it says that even though prayer and repentance and trying to strive to get closer to God, all those things are always good ideas. There's something special about this time, these high holidays, these yom yom no roim, days of awe, as they're sometimes called, these 10 days of repentance, because it's much more potent, it's much more efficacious. Everything that we do, every step that we take is amplified on these days. So uh, the small effort goes much further during the 10 days, beginning with Rosh Hashanah and concluding with Yom Kippur. Why? So it quotes a verse in Isaiah. Dershu Hashem bihi matzo, karu bihi yoso karov. Seek out Hashem when he may be found. Call upon him when he is near. Says the Talmud, when is the time? What this implies that God is sometimes to be found, sometimes can't be found. Sometimes is near, sometimes is distant. What are these days? What are this time period where God is close, God is near, God is accessible to us? That's the 10 days beginning with Rosh Hashanah and culminating with Yom Kippur. In fact, the verse in the book of Leviticus, uh, Leviticus 16.30, where it talks about Yom Kippur and then it kind of encapsulates what is Yom Kippur, what is this day of Yom Kippur, on this day, the Almighty will atone for us and purify us from all our sins. Close to God, we shall become pure. Similarly, we see this idea that on Yom Kippur, it's obviously the, 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 the acme, the, the climax of the 10 days of repentance. We're close to God. There's an idea of, of closeness. And... Therefore, it's important to learn about these days and to try to maximize our output that we could have on the days where everything is more valuable, everything is more uh, powerful, everything, uh, the efforts that we, the input that we do uh, yield a much greater output during these times. Last night I was thinking, just an analogy, the president is granted with with lots of powers, but there's one power that's super cool, the power to grant clemency, to pardon people who are offenders, to commute sentences. And I was thinking just an analogy. Suppose you, you know, there's a bunch of convicts or criminals and they hear that the president is coming to their facility and he's going to be meeting for 10 days with all the people and trying to hear their story and see if they're a worthy candidate of having their sentence commuted or being parted. So like, how much will people prepare for that? How much will they get their ideas in order and, and present their arguments and be prepared? No one will want to stay, oh, you know what, I'm, uh, I don't want to stay in the yard. I want to stay in my room. There's a long line. It takes so long, right? It's 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 arduous process. I was like, no, wow, what an opportunity. The, the, the president, the king is near. I want to seek him out. Now he can be found. I want to try to call out to him when it's accessible. And I think that that's certainly one one strain of the holiday, that there's there's judgment. Dave, Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. Yom Kippur is a day of, of sealing of the judgment. And these 10 days are this very seriousness and awesomeness to it. And that kind of could play out with, with, with this analogy that like we could be saved from despair. We, who knows what could happen? The upcoming year is full of uh, – it's the unknown. What's going to be with us? What's going to be with our family? What's going to be with our community? What's going to be with our people, out of the world? What's going to happen? How can we be saved? Let's try to lobby the president. Let's lobby the king. Let's lobby God. That's kind of one angle of this closeness. But in addition, this is also an opportunity, even if we don't view ourselves as inmates in some facility and thinking of like, oh, how can we save ourselves from terrible things? There's also the positive side. You know, the king is close and he wants to develop relationships with us. And of course, in Jewish philosophy, 
that's the whole goal of life. The whole goal of life is you're thrown into this world and will you or will you not develop a, relation, a relationship with the Almighty? Will you realize that there's only one thing in the world that's fixed, that's permanent, that's real? Everything else is just there because God wants us to use that to get close to him. So according to Jewish philosophy, everything, the whole reason why the world exists and the whole reason why we're created and really our objective in life, our mission is, will you or will you not develop a relationship with God? That's the challenge. That's the free will. That's everything. And now God's close and he's taking applications. Who wants to be close? Who wants to develop something when he's close? So that way, when it's not the most auspicious time of the year, it's now after Yom Kippur. But you know what? I forged the relationship with the Almighty on the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. On these days where God was close to us, I maximized my effort to try to foster and deepen a relationship. And you know what? That's going to last even beyond the high holidays. And I think a lot of the perception that we have of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is around the shul and around the ceremonies and the rituals. And, and of course, that's there. But I think this is the the, the core, like the, the, the fundamental essence of these days. It's days where God is close to us. And therefore, we have all kinds of amazing opportunities to shape our lives going forward. My grandfather used to say that ascending a spiritual ladder has to be done one rung at a time. If you try to do too much, you try to bite off more than you could chew, well, then you might collapse. If you try to, 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 to leap forward, well, then you may fall down. You try to access too much, you try to fight too much, you try to overcome too much, try to change too much, it might be a little, it might, have, it might backfire. There's certain times in the year where those rules don't apply. Those rules are strapped. Where you could do one giant leap and that's totally fine because that's the, that's the order of the day. And you would talk about, for example, Pesach. Pesach is a day where the Jewish people had a great leap forward. Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, these are similarly, these are days where we can achieve a, a quantum leap that exceeds accumulation of the rest of the year combined. Therefore, I think it's it's important to learn about the power of the day, the essence of the day, and some of the tactics that we could use to be more successful. Now, because these days are called the days of repentance, I think it's important to learn about what repentance is, what it's not, what are the variables of repentance, what are the ways to do it, what are the problems with repentance, why is it hard for us, and in addition, understanding wh- what it is in essence. You know, in Hebrew, the word for repentance is teshuva, which is the same word of returning or restoring, which, which means that repentance is not necessarily about, about actions per se, but about the implications of those actions. And in fact, we say in Yom Kippur that we're acknowledging that our actions created more distance between us and the Almighty, made us less spiritual, less connected with our soul, and more physical, and more kind of living in the temporary ephemeral world, and not prioritizing what maybe we know we ought to prioritize. But that's kind of the, in, 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 in the maelstrom of the, of the year, that, that maybe tends to happen. And Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, we're kind of realigning our priorities. We're recognizing that our collective actions and habits are maybe pushing us away from God. And we want to return. We want to repent, but return to a more natural state for our soul. To to identify with who you are spiritually, who you are eternally, that really you're a soul that's supposed to be close to God and you're so distant from God because of all kinds of other factors. Okay, I want to return to that. And I think it's it's important to look at kind of the difference between the first couple of days of repentance, which is Rosh Hashanah, and the final day of repentance, which is which is Yom Kippur. Of course, there's a mitzvah to repent every day, and everyone talks about this. That it's not there's not just ten days of repentance. It's I mean, one of the mitzvahs in the Torah. One of the six thirteen mitzvahs is a, is to repent. But specifically, these days are the days that are most apt for repentance. These are days that are oriented around repentance. These are days where all the rituals and all the ceremonies and all the prayers and liturgies are all oriented around getting you in the right frame of mind to return to God. So I think it's important 
to understand what is this repentance of Rosh Hashanah? What are we kind of doing on Rosh Hashanah to achieve the repentance? And maybe what's the difference between repentance of Yom Kippur and how maybe they complement each other? So one of the fundamental questions that, that people probe on this 10-day unit of the year is what is the nature of the repentance? What is the nature of the repentance of Rosh Hashanah? And what is the nature of repentance of Yom Kippur? Because classically, you look at the Talmud, you look at the Rambam, he's very methodical about this particular point, the laws of repentance. Classically, repentance is always linked to sin. A sin, it creates distance between man and God. It creates a spiritual blemish in man's soul. Repentance is fixing that, it's undoing that, it's restoring the relationship the way it was prior. It's rectifying the sin and its consequences. That's the way repentance is talked about classically. And if you look at the Yom Kippur prayer, for example, one of the refrains that we revisit on Yom Kippur prayer again and again is the al portion of the prayer, which lists 50 different categories of sin that we're liable or likely to have committed over the past year. And we're asking God, forgive me for this sin, forgive me for that sin, forgive me for that sin, forgive me for that sin. And that is repeated 10 times over the whole holiday, beginning even before Yom Kippur. So if you should do the math, we're talking about, we're mentioning invoking sin hundreds upon hundreds of times in Yom Kippur. It seems to make sense. If it's a day of repentance, repentance is about sin. Well, you mention sin and you ask to be atoned for it, you try to repent for it. You look at Rosh Hashanah and you peruse the whole prayer book and you don't, you don't see any mention of any sin, not even one. And yet, this is a day of repentance. It's the first two days, two days of Rosh Hashanah, two days of repentance. The first two of the ten days of repentance. So evidently, there's a kind of repentance that has nothing to do with sin at all. Sin is not discussed at all. And that's one form of repentance. And then there's a different form of repentance, seemingly. So I want to understand the the genesis of these two days and understand how the repentance of Rosh Hashanah is linked to the actual essence of the day and the backstory of the day and how the repentance of Yom Kippur is linked to the origination, to the initiation of that particular holiday. Because we know with every Jewish holiday – there's, it has some sort of spiritual essence. It's not just a day in the calendar that happens to coincide with some previous event. It's a day that is assigned a certain spiritual power because of the events that happened that day. And therefore, that same spiritual power appears when that day is revisited. That's how we understand the Jewish calendar. And therefore, if we understand what, what the essence of Rosh Hashanah is and the repentance of Rosh Hashanah and how it differs from Yom Kippur, it's important to look at the backstory of that of, the, of those days, the origin stories of those days, and then see how it plays out today. So the very first Rosh Hashanah was day six of creation. The Talmud tells us that the world was created on the 25th day of Elul. The month after Elul is Tishrei. And thus, the first day of Tishrei is day six of creation. And of course, what appeared in day six of creation? You have some animals, but then, of course, you have Adam and Adam and Eve. And everything that happened in the Garden of Eden also happened on that day. Someone pointed out to me recently that the first time there was judgment in the world was when Adam and Eve did their sin. Well, okay, if Adam and Eve did the sin and they were judged for it, maybe that's the first day of judgment, and therefore that became a day that was always assigned to the day of judgment because that's when judgment got started. But a, a, a kind of a more broad understanding of, of the day is as follows. We know, according to Jewish philosophy, that the objective of the world is mankind. Why is mankind so important? Of the trillions of species, why is man mankind unique? Because mankind is unique because man is a mixture, a fusion of a spiritual component, of a physical component, of an animal, essentially. Instinctually, we're very similar to animals. But we also have like an angelic side of us. We also have a spiritual side in us. And those are wound together like only God could do, creating the ability at this touch point of these two dichotomies, of these two opposites, it creates free will. 
Now, how God creates free will is a very hard question to answer because it's asking how God operates, which is something we don't know how God operates. But that's the idea according to Jewish philosophy, that the, that man has free will and therefore man is the objective. Well, why? Because the way it's explained in the classic uh, uh, Jewish philosophy, that man, because man can accept or reject God, therefore, by man accepting God, that creates almost like an independent verification of God's dominion. Means if, if God has animals and angels and all kinds of other things, entities, None of them have free will to be able to reject God, to repudiate God. That's not possible. Angel can't repudiate God. An animal can't repudiate God. Neither of them can because they don't have free will. Mankind, of course, can. You could either embrace it or you could reject it. And therefore, what happens when a human embraces God? So the way it's explained, the way it's uh, phrased is that God is upgraded from being an autocrat, from being a dictator, to being a king. Because God has the power and will always have the power. That's fixed. That's unchangeable. However, the relationship that God has with his world has now been changed because there's someone, something, or some things that can reject God, i.e. humans can with their free will reject God and choose nonetheless to accept it, to accept that idea. Therefore, God is now no longer ruling just by force, so to speak. Now he's ruling by by, by popular demand. Humanity says, okay, we accept you. When did that happen? When did God's kingdom, so to speak, get initiated? Well, when Adam came around. And of course, Adam later on would have his troubles on day six. But the Midrash tells us that when Adam arrived, the animals were so wowed by him, they said, oh, this must be God. And they said, oh, you know, no, let's start. They, they, they and they, promptly proceeded to start bowing down before him. So Major Major says. And Adam says, no, 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 you're making a mistake. I'm not God. And he said, he brought all the animals and together with him, they bow down before the Almighty. That's what the Major says. But the idea is, is that there's something here that changed. Adam could have said, yeah, bring it on. Give me the honor. Give me the plaudits. He could have said that, but he chose to accept God. That's what the Midrash says. And therefore, something changed on that day. That that day now became the day that was assigned. This is the day where God's kingdom was created, essentially. And if you look throughout the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, throughout the, the themes of Rosh Hashanah, the mitzvah of blowing the shofar, for example, you blow the shofar when you are an, proclaiming and announcing a new kingdom. That's what they do. And... In the Musaf prayer, for example, like what the, the central element of the Musaf, Musaf prayer is what's called Malchios, which is, mal, ma, the word Melech means king, kingdom, which means we go through 10 verses from all parts of the Tanakh, from the Torah, from the Rim, the Ksuf, from, from the Torah, and from the prophets, and from the, from the writings, talking about God's dominion. That's kind of what we're emphasizing on the day. Now, how does judgment fit into this? If this is the day where man was created and subsequently God's kingdom was created, kingdom as opposed to autocracy, well, how does judgment fit into that puzzle? The answer is, is okay, every year this is God's kingdom gets renewed. Kind of that, that's the spiritual essence of the day. Well, what happens when a kingdom gets renewed? What happens when there's a new administration in town? Well, they have to vet every official, every bureaucrat, every uh, every minister, every part of the government, so to speak, gets evaluated. Is this uh, something we want to keep for the next year or for the next cycle? Or do we want to find a better replacement? The dual themes of the day really are one and the same. This is the day where God's kingdom got kick-started. And therefore, every year, there's a certain power, spiritual power of God's kingdom that goes all the way back to the original day of Rosh Hashanah, to the original Adam, where this is the day where God's kingdom is was initiated and gets reinitiated every year. And therefore, that creates judgment. Because when there is a new kingdom... We have to evaluate every person. Is, uh, this, is this person an asset we want to keep on board for the, for the kingdom or not? 
do we want to discard this person because this person is not advancing the cause of the kingdom? That's the way they explain kind of the, the, the backstory of Rosh Hashanah. So when we are coronating God on Rosh Hashanah, this is also a certain form of repentance. We don't mention sin at all, at all. I think there's, there's at least two ways to explain how announcing that God is the king and accepting that and kind of ruminating upon that, how that results in repentance. So first of all, suppose someone committed crimes against the kingdom. The only way for that person to repent, so to speak, to undo that, what's the first step? The first step is they have to realize what they did. It's like the first step of the 12 steps. The first step of any change is you have to recognize that something bad happened or your, your life is unsustainable or unmanageable. Well, how do you do that? If you don't recognize that God has the power and all the dominion, then you don't realize that doing things that are putting distance between you and him matter. Suppose the king hires you to paint his palace. And he tells you the exact shade of paint that he wants you to paint it in. So you go to the store and you find you, he wants white. Does it matter if it's this off-white? It's that off-white? There's a thousand different off-whites. What does it matter? You just grab the first one you see. And you paint the whole palace. Right? And the king comes to you, what are you doing? I, I, did, I told you this shade, not that shade. You say, who are you? Well, why do I need to answer you? Unless you realize that you're dealing with a king, you don't realize that his instructions matter and they have validity. And, they, and you, not just some person you can just do away with. This is the king. The, the first step, so to speak, of even before you even address your sins, you have to realize, okay, these are not just sins against some dude, some random dude. This was sins against the king. That was kind of one way to understand. So like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur really, they, they, they go together. Yom Kippur, we talk about all our sins. But the only way we can come to Yom Kippur and say, oh, we made so many mistakes against the will of the Almighty is only when we first spend two days enshrining God on his heavenly throne, so to speak, recognizing the, 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 the power of the Almighty. And only then can we say, okay, well, now we did something wrong. Let's try to, to address it. That's, that's one way to understand what's the repentance of Rosh Hashanah. It's only through Rosh Hashanah can we have Yom Kippur. Only when we recognize the seriousness and the gravity of our behavior can we properly seek atonement for our misdeeds. If we don't recognize the misdeeds, we can't try to seek forgiveness for them. That's the first idea. A second idea is that in essence, and this is a theme that we see in many places in Jewish literature, all sins against God have an element of idolatry to it, which is a very shocking statement. But the idea is, is that, okay, what, what is idolatry? Idolatry is when someone has a deity that's more powerful than God in, the, in their view. Well, if the Almighty says, do this, and someone says, eh, not in the mood. So what does that mean? It means that there's some competing motivation that has, maybe even temporarily, superseded God in the totem pole. Conversely, God says, don't do it. You say, yeah, Yetzirah says I should do it. So the Talmud says the Yetzirah is a false god because it is trumping. It's, it's, its priorities, its agenda has now superseded God. So in essence, every sin is where the, the, the underpinnings, the, the core of, of, of sin is lack of recognition of God's dominion. So in essence, once someone on Rosh Hashanah spends the whole day coronating God as king, that, in effect, even though it doesn't address sins, but addresses the undergirding essence of why we sin, and therefore it's kind of fixing it by proxy. You're fixing the core problem, not by addressing the sins itself, but by addressing the fundamental flaw that's allowed the sins to flourish, though, which is allowing God to uh, be overridden by some other competing factor. To make him not fully attained, not 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 all powerful. You assign him all power, and then you address the sins as a result. Uh, uh, consequently, 
So that's Rosh Hashanah. What is what is the backstory of Yom Kippur, and how does the forgiveness seeking and repentance of Yom Kippur fit into the bad story of the day. So the original Yom Kippur, the first time Yom Kippur was a distinct day, doesn't go back all the way to Adam. It goes back to uh, the year after the Jewish people left Egypt. Moshe goes up onto the mountain, of course, sits the day of Sivan, which is the day of the Ten Commandments, the day of the Revelation at Sinai. He tells the Jewish people, I'll see you in 40 days. I'll be, I'll have all the Torah to dispense to you from God. Hold tight. And they start counting, and 40 days later, Moshe doesn't show up. And they made a miscalculation because they thought it was 40 days, and day one was the day he went up. But really, it was 40 full days. So really, they were on day 39. They thought it was day 40. And then a whole bunch of factors contributed towards, eventually, the making of the golden calf, as the story is told in the book of Exodus. God is in the middle of a session with Moshe, and he tells him, okay, it's time to go down. The Jewish people made a huge blunder. I'm going to kill them all, and we'll start from scratch. It's, it's a really a terrible sin, uh, a sin that really justified and warranted the Jewish people to be destroyed. And Moshe starts praying, and he takes the, gold, the, the two tablets given to him by hewn by God, crashes him, takes the golden calf, grinds it into a fine dust, makes the Jewish people drink from it, a whole bunch of people die. He tells his brethren, the Levites, to, to, to brandish their swords and go kill all the offenders. And this is, okay, now we got rid of the, the, the offenders. Will you reconsider, he says, God. And he goes up against the mountain for 40 more days. He goes a third time, 40 days. And finally, 120 days after his initial ascent to the mountain, he's been uh, up and down now, th- uh, now uh, three times. Finally, God says, I have forgiven as you have requested. What day is the day? where the Jewish people were, who were condemned to be destroyed entirely by God because of this sin, what was it that finally got acceded to Moshe's prayer and intercession? That is Yom Kippur. And the day after Yom Kippur is when the Jewish people started building the Mishkan. But what do we do the day after Yom Kippur? We start building the Sukkah, our equivalent almost of, of, of the Mishkan. So in essence, like this day is unique because this was a day where God was finally convinced to forgive the Jewish people. And therefore, the power and essence of the day is a day that's designed for atonement, for forgiveness. Not just forgiveness for small sins, but even the most grievous sins that really would have warranted the Jewish people to be destroyed. And therefore, from from, from that time, uh, from thenceforth, The day of Yom Kippur is a day that's most suitable for all kinds of atonement. And if you actually work this out, what does the Almighty tell us? I'm going to seal your judgment. Which day am I going to seal your judgment on? On Yom Kippur. It's like incredible kindness that the Almighty did for us. That the day that he is most predisposed to acquittal, to forgiving us, that is also the day that he's going to assign as the day of the sealing of the judgment. The day of the rendering of the verdict is the day where he's most likely to forgive us. And kind of understanding that, like it, 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 one of the major misconceptions I think we have to get rid of or that we're most likely to be harboring since childhood maybe even is the fact that Yom Kippur is kind of a somber day. It's a sad day. It's a day of prayer. It's a day of fasting. It's a day of, oh my gosh, I can't believe we've been in shul for five hours already and we're not even halfway done. That is an attitude that I think a lot of people have. When you understand what the day is, where it comes from, what it means, play it out kind of, when was the first Yom Kippur? It was the day where God forgave us. And we invoke it in the prayers. We talk about that this is the day that God says, I will forgive you. What does the verse say in in Leviticus? This is the day that God is promising us he will forgive us. He will purify us. He will cleanse us from all our sins. We're close to him. It's, It's an incredible, it's the happiest day of the year. It's the most joyous day of the year. It's the most delightful day of the year. It's, it's, it's the greatest gift that God gave us, maybe. He gave us the Torah. The greatest day that he gave us is the day of of Yom Kippur. Looking at it in that light, 
everything that we do in Yom Kippur that we think are related to mourning, they really stem from the essence of the day. They were close to God. They God is forgiving us. It's a day, commentaries tell us, we're like angels. The angels don't eat. How could we eat? We dress in white. We say prayers that only angels say. That is what Yom Kippur is really all about. The fasting and all the things that we don't do are all things that we don't want to do, that, 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 that may distract us from, from the, the purpose and the essence of the day and the power of the day. And my teacher would point out another interesting idea. He would say that if you think about it, like what day, the day that we're trying to achieve atonement, what day do we need merits more than any other? Yom Kippur. This is the day that our ruling is being rendered. Well, okay. Think about it. The Almighty says, I'm going to give you a mitzvah to fast for 26 hours, 25 hours. Don't eat, don't drink. And don't wear leather shoes and don't engage in marital intercourse and don't wash, don't take showers. That's what the... And and the, the Torah says, this is... Suffer. It said, suffer a little bit. Right? Torment yourself a little bit. My teacher pointed out, he's like, Think about it. The more difficult a mitzvah is, the more reward you get, the more spiritual benefit you garner from it. On the day that we need the most spiritual benefit, the Almighty gives us this mitzvah, which it's not the end of the world. In fact, they even say that intermittent fasting, fasting is actually one of the healthiest things you could possibly do. But that's a side point. It's not, Yes, your stomach may be grumbling, and you may think, oh my gosh, I just have eight more hours of this. You may feel like that. And that's that's okay. That's that's a feature, not a bug. Right? That is a, that is part of the design because that gives you more spiritual clout to achieve your uh, objective on this holiday. I want to pivot now to the more practical elements of achieving atonement. So there's a few tactics that we see in the Talmud, and one of the basic assumptions of the Talmud. And probably, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll probably agree that it makes a lot of sense. One of the basic assumptions is that any person, or almost any person, if they're judged on the merits of their behavior, they probably will not prevail. Probably. Because if God is kind of strict and exacting in judgment, then if he's really a prosecutor and, and, and unleashing everything on us, there's no way that we could possibly, as individuals, prevail. So how do we work around that? So there's a few tactics that we see um, brought down in, in, in by the commentators and the sages. So one of them is the fact that the Jewish people, as a nation, will always come out victorious on Yom Kippur. Always. Why? Because the Almighty says, he pledges, he's pledged in the past, that the Jewish people will be the eternal nation. And to be the eternal nation means to survive every Yom Kippur and, and to be granted another year of life every time the judgment is sealed. Therefore, the commentators point out, one of the instead of trying to be judged as individuals, let's try to find ways to be judged as part of the community. And if we cleave to the community and don't deviate from the community – then we're likely to be included in the judgment of the community and survive and make it through. So one of the ways that this was done is by people trying before Yom Kippur to become as integral to the masses as possible. To try to think of ways that I can be or I can make myself more valuable to the community and therefore, to be more likely to be judged as a member of the community, not as an individual. So, for example, the person who sets up the tables, well, they're doing a, a benefit from the community. It's not just – they're not living for themselves. They're living – of course, it's a small example, but they're living for everyone because they're, they're doing something for the benefit of everyone. And therefore, they're acting in a way, not as an individual, or at least in, the small, in this small era, they're not acting not just as an individual. They're acting as part of the community. 
And the more things that people accept to say, I'm going to be an asset to the community, the more they're kind of spreading out their identity and making themselves more of a communal person. And therefore, their judgment is going to be reflective of that and the more likely to be judged with the whole community. Which is why one of the things that we try to think about on Rishayim Kippur is how can I become more of an asset to the community, to the Jewish people at large? If I am so vital and the Jewish people need me, well then, for me to be judged, the whole Jewish nation has to be judged because after all, they need me. And therefore, I'm more likely to to prevail. Uh, In addition... We try not to do things that will remove us from the community. So I've mentioned this teaching here in the past. It's one of the most, on on the surface, one of the most surprising and striking teachings you'll see see in the Talmud. It doesn't seem to make sense initially. Talmud says in the book of Yoma, on page 88a, the following astonishing statement. They taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael, Haroe Keri Biyom Hatipurim. Someone who experiences a seminal emission on Yom Kippur. Yidag Kolashana. They should worry the whole year they're probably going to die. However, if that person survives the year, he should be confident that he's a pretty righteous person. So if you just read that teaching, you're like, okay, this seems like there's some sort of mistake here. What? If a person sees some emotion, they're going to die. But if they don't, well, then they're very righteous. They're worthy of all of Seems kind of very polarizing. Either you're going to die or you're going to, you're, you're so righteous. What's going on over here? So my grandfather explained that when someone sees a seminal emission on Yom Kippur, in essence, that, that activity is removing themselves from, from the masses, from the community. After all, the whole community is engaging in carnal pleasure, pleasure denial, in denying physical pleasure, and this person is, is not denying, he's embracing it. Well, by doing that, they are removing themselves from the community. If you do that on Yom Kippur, you're in essence telling God, I don't need the community, I'm on my own. Judge me on my own. Says the Talmud, you'll probably die that year. But if you don't, well, what does that mean? It means that you were judged on your own. And you probably are fairly righteous because you managed to survive the whole year. That's what the Talmud says. There's an, an idea that I think if we, if we read it, it might sound kind of surprising. But it, th- th- this is the point. The point is, is that Yom Kippur is a time for us to try to make ourselves as much of an asset to the community and try to not deviate from the activities of the community. In addition, the Talmud tells us, that a way to ensure that God will forgive us is if we are forgiving to other people who may have slighted us. It says the Talmud, book of Rosh Hashanah, page 17a, kol ma'avir al mitosav, if someone forgives others, foregoes the slights that others have perpetrated against them, then God will forgive that person for, the, for their sins. Says Rashi, Rashi explains, if someone is not precise, if someone is not exacting in their judgment of other people, God in turn will not be exacting in their judgment of that person. And therefore, just like they're able to forgive others, God will forgive them. And conversely, the opposite is true as well. If someone is very exacting and precise in their judgment and not yielding to another person, in essence, they're telling God, treat me the same way. And this is a general principle we see in Jewish theology. God treats us the way we treat other people, measure for measure, tit for tat. If you are unwilling and unflexible, inflexible in allowing other people to let their misdeeds slide, in essence, you're telling God, treat me the same way. The way you treat others is the way you're telling God that you want to be treated by him. And therefore, if you're not willing to forgive others, you're in effect telling God, please don't forgive me as well. And kind of on a deeper level, seeking forgiveness is where man is telling God, listen, I sinned, but you know what? I changed. I'm a different person. If I had the same opportunity for that same sin, I wouldn't do it now. I realized what I did was wrong. I realized what I did made 
more distance between me and you. I regret it. I'm not going to do it again. I'm a different person. If someone is willing to forgive others, then the, it means it shows and exhibits that they believe that people could change. You know what? The person did something bad to me. But you know what? They changed. I'm willing to treat them now the way they are today, not the way they were yesterday when they mistreated me. If someone is not willing to view other people as being different, they say, you know what? You did something bad to me five years ago, and I will never forgive you no matter what you do. Well, they're in effect telling God or announcing to the world, people cannot change. They are always the same person that did that same slight. Well, if you're announcing that, okay, you'll get what you uh you'll reap what you sow. You're telling God, you know what? People can change. And God says, Oh, how could you come to me now and say, Give me forgiveness? How could you say, Oh, I'm a different person? No, no, no. You just showed me yesterday that you're not a, that you don't believe in this whole idea of becoming a different person. And I don't want to get too sidetracked with this point, but the Talmud says that suppose someone sins with the explicit intention to repent of Yom Kippur. I'll sin today, but you know what? Yom Kippur will come around and I'll make it square with God. Says the Talmud, Yom Kippur won't work for that person. Why? If you think I'm on a very deep level, it's the same idea. The argument that we p- present to God in Yom Kippur, the, 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 the statement of defense is, yes, I sinned, but I'm a different person. If I had the opportunity today, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't do it. The Ramam even says, quoted from the Talmud, you should even try to change your name. People don't actually do that, but I, that was Joe. Now I'm, I'm someone else. I, I'm a different person. Well, Suppose someone says, I'm going to sin, but I'll repent to Yom Kippur. What happens to Yom Kippur? They try to repent. It's the same person. When he did the sin, he said, I'll repent to Yom Kippur. And now he's, he's trying to repent to Yom Kippur. There's no change. Therefore, if someone says, I will sin and, and Yom Kippur will forgive me, I'll rep- forgive Yom Kippur. That, in essence, is fixing. The, he shows that he has the Yom Kippur attitude and he still sins. Comes along Yom Kippur. He cannot undo that. And therefore, when we're willing to say, when someone comes and asks us for forgiveness, we're willing to accept them. We're willing to be able to put the past behind us and say, you know what? I accept your request for forgiveness. I fully forgive you with all my heart. When we're doing that, we're in essence opening the floodgates for our own forgiveness. It's not easy when someone does something bad to you to be able to overlook that, to be able to move past that. But it really... Is, is a boon for our relationship with God. The Talmud tells a story of uh, two great sages, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva. And there was a, uh, there was a drought in Israel. And this is before Israel was the cutting edge of desalination. And when there's a drought and you're living in an agrarian society without the ability to import grain and things like that, a drought, in effect, will lead to famine, which will lead to starvation and mass death. So there's a whole book of Talmud dealing with what do the sages do when there's a, when there's a drought. Because, of course, as Jews, we understand that God is treating us, you know, he's treating us in a specific way to try to get us to change. Therefore, if, if there's no rain in Israel, what is he telling us? He wants us to pray. He wants us to repent, to improve our ways. So there's a whole book dealing with what the sages did. So it says that there was two sages, and they gathered the whole Jewish community. And, and, and because there was a drought. And the great Rebbe Yezer starts praying and says 24 blessings, and it doesn't start raining. And comes along the Rabbi Akiva, who was his disciple, but also the one of the giants of the generation. And he starts praying, Avinu Malkeinu, our father our king. Ain lanu melech we have no king besides for you. Avinu Malkeinu, do it for your sake. For, have mercy on us. And the, it gets suddenly cloudy and it starts raining. And everyone in the batch starts snickering. Look at this. Rabbi Lezer starts praying and nothing happens. And Rabbi, and Rabbi Kiva starts praying and right away it starts, starts raining. Obviously, Rabbi Kiva is the greatest scholar. That's what they all start saying. And immediately they all hear a booming prophetic voice. No, Rabbi Kiva is not necessarily a greatest scholar. Rather, 
The difference is, is that Rabbi Yezer comes from the school of Shammai. And the school of Shammai was very precise and very exacting. And therefore, he wasn't someone who was so as so easily foregoing the misdeeds of others. Therefore, his power of prayer is less potent than that of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, on the other hand, he was someone who was so easy to forgive. He was more of the base Hillel school, and therefore his prayer has more potency. So it's not just that we can get more forgiveness from God by forgiving others. We really are becoming a tool to access all kinds of godly goodness when we are forgiving others. It's so one of the most important things of Yom Kippur is to be able to forgive others. Of course, Yom Kippur is oriented around seeking forgiveness from God, just like we are going to try to forgive others who request forgiveness and even those who don't. We should try to ask our friends for forgiveness because Yom Kippur will be very helpful if done properly in trying to get forgiveness from God but forgiveness from our fellow man can only happen if we ask them for forgiveness and they are willing to accept our overtures and agree to our appeasement and forgive us. Yom Kippur will not work for sins against other people. And that's why the day before Yom Kippur, we try to reach out, more, or the time before Yom Kippur, to reach out to people that we may have had interactions that were less than stellar over the past year, maybe even altercations or disagreements or things like that, try to smooth things over and restore the feelings of goodwill and closeness and and kinship with them before Yom Kippur to make sure that we can emerge from Yom Kippur with a clean slate, both in our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. Another important thing um, that to keep in mind in the whole arena of repentance is the idea that even if we don't repent fully and we don't repent completely, it's the one mitzvah that it's not all or nothing. If someone wears tzitzis and it's not a four-corner garment, it's only a three-corner garment, they haven't fulfilled 0%. It's not like they've fulfilled 75% of the mitzvah. They feel nothing. And most, most mitzvahs are like that, that you either do it or you don't do it. Repentance is a mitzvah that's comprised of lots of different com- components. Like there's, you're regretting your previous mistakes, you feel bad of, of what they did and what they caused, the distance that they that they f- created between you and God. It, you, it's about regret. It's about committing never doing it. There's there's re- there's confession. There's a verbal confession. On your people, we do that at all. You know, all that is part of the prayers. The whole repentance is part of the prayers, and therefore, if, if we are in the environment, it's all oriented around getting us in to, 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 to do all these components of, of Yom Kippur. But whatever we do, we should try um, to make it as meaningful as possible. But also, we should be aware that it's not all or nothing. We're trying to change. We're trying to put ourselves, you know, even if we, if we change a little bit, like that in itself means that we're in the mode of changing. So I would say, Certainly, you know, if you think about every area of your life, every area probably could use a boost and use improvement. That's just probably true by most humans. We're not perfect. We're flawed. We have areas that we need to improve. And if we try to do it all in Yom Kippur and try to change a million different areas, it's probably not going to last. But if we try to find like one area that we could genuinely change, take one small step, in the hopes that that will lead to future, future, future steps. And if you play it out kind of on the uh, on the chart, it will eventually lead to you changing everything. That is considered, because you took the first step of a mile, of a hundred million mile journey on Yom Kippur, the way the Almighty will judge you is by the ultimate culmination of that journey. Even though your, your step today, the practical step today is not changing everything because that's not an effective way to change, but it's judged as if it would be. And therefore, even though – so two ideas. Even though we're only practically changing in a small way and we're hoping to change in a, in, in a, in a grander way, but the actual change today is, 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 is a little bit, that goes a long way, number one. Number two, that any amount of change – is valuable even if it's not uh, total. I always advise people uh, to just make it a little easier with the fasting. Don't start uh, drinking water the day before Yom Kippur. 
you know, they say there's always these long lines outside the bathroom but by Tol Nidre. Uh, because people just like, uh, you know, it's like uh, cramming before a test. <laughs> I always, always start drinking three or four days beforehand. Uh, it's really not hard today. We have very strong compositions, unless, of course, someone has health problems, things like that. Discuss with your doctor. But most healthy people can do it no problem. Uh, it may be a little bit uncomfortable, but it's really, it's really should not be the dominating uh, concern of the day. It's almost like we're, we're pushing the food to the side. It's not, it's not significant. There's mu- much uh, bigger fish to fry, no pun intended. Um, there's bigger agenda items. There's plenty of time the whole year to eat and to drink. Um, so it's, it's a good advice to try to prepare yourself as well as you can. Uh, there's a tradition that we do to try to make a resolution on Yom Kippur. Uh, it should be something small, something manageable, but something that we could keep for the whole year and something that could affect a wide area of our lives uh, to try to cast a, uh, a wide net uh, with something small, but something that that really will affect our lives. It could be anything, um, but as long as it's something which, which will really, uh, if done consistently, will become uh, habitual. In addition, uh, my teacher would advise us to pledge on Yom Kippur Make a resolution that all future resolutions that you make this year should already be considered as part of your defense argument on Yom Kippur. So say, well, I don't know what I'm going to choose, what I'm going to decide to do good, but everything I decide to do good, treat it as if I did it already today. And hopefully, when we have these ideas in mind on the high holidays and the tenets of repentance, we will be ready armed, dear, to make the most of these very powerful days and to hopefully, we should all be blessed with a Kasiva Chesimatova, which should be written and inscribed and sealed in the Book of Life. It should be a fantastic year for the whole Jewish people, for ourselves, our families, our communities, our Jewish brethren throughout America, throughout the world, and of course, our brethren in Israel be a fantastic year on all fronts uh, for everyone that we know. And uh, that's my hope. That's my blessing to all of you. It was an absolutely stellar 5778. Thank you all for your participation, your consistent participation, <laughs> and uh, your friendship. Thank you so, so much. I look forward to another amazing year in 5779.